Thanks very much, Diane. Uh, I guess I'd better introduce myself. I'm Stephen Fredman, a professor in the English department at Notre Dame. And uh, there are a number of people I'd like to thank um, for making this exhibition and um, symposium possible. To begin with, I'd like to thank Susan Omer, who was the interim director of the library when the purchase was first initiated. Uh, I'd also like to thank Laura Futerer for uh, her extensive work in acquiring the, the collection. I'd like to thank Sarah Weber for graphic design and logistics for the conference, and to thank George Rugg and Liz Duby for mounting the exhibition. I'd like to thank Buzz Spector, the photographer, for permission to use his beautiful Polaroid of Creeley's Creeley's for the introductory poster to the exhibition and for the publicity. And I'd like to thank Harriet Baldwin and Laura Ro Lori Roberts for all the arrangements for this symposium. And finally, I'd like to thank Elliot Visconti for funding the video documentation and streaming of the symposium, as well as its later editing for YouTube. And then we have the donors to the, who made the collection possible, John Jay and Terry Bowman, the Howard and Evangeline Phelan Collection in English and American Literature, and the President's Circle and also the sponsors for this symposium, the Department of English, the Hesburgh Libraries, and the Institute for Scholarship in the Liberal Arts. A couple of words about Robert Creeley, whom you're seeing in various wonderful candid photos that Penelope has provided. Um, it's very hard to know how to take the measure of someone, of a poet like Robert Creeley. The vividness, really, of his moment-to-moment -moment living of his emphatic connection to people and places in whose company he found himself, the delight and astonishment in noticing again and again merely that he was aware. These were all facets of an immense capacity for living, of which his poetry is a partial but substantial record. Where one found him was in conversation. It was paradoxical to see a person of exquisite self-consciousness and insistent self-effacement, who yet was always out there in dialogue with others. I can't think of anyone I've known who so thoroughly approached life as a conversation with other people. We're celebrating that conversation today in several ways. First, inhaling the publication of the selected letters of Robert Creeley by the University of California Press, edited by Rod Smith, Peter Baker and Kaplan Harris, who's with us today. We're also celebrating the conversation he engaged in through his library, in which he used books, his own and those sent him by friends and acquaintances, as what you might call filing cabinets, that he filled with letters, postcards, photographs, brochures, reviews, interviews, plane tickets, hotel bills. And finally, we're celebrating the remarkable conversations he undertook with many great artists, which eventuated in probably the most extensive and beautiful collaborations in which a modern poet has participated, and which you can see some of in the exhibition. So now I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker, Penelope Creeley. Born in London, raised in New Zealand, she studied French, German, and English literature at the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. She met Robert Creeley in 1976 when he was traveling in New Zealand as a U.S. bicentennial poet to Southeast Asia. They, she moved to the United States in July of 1976 and they married and had two children and uh, also continued a life of extensive travel and extensive picking up and moving of households. Penelope studied landscape architecture at Cornell University in the graduate program from 1984 to 1985. Creeley's also spent a year in Helsinki, Finland, then settled in Buffalo, where Penelope became involved in community restoration through neighborhood organizations. They moved to Providence, Rhode Island in 2003, and she has moved to Waldeboro, Maine in 2011. She knows nearly everyone in the poetry community and is wonderfully gracious in making connections among people. I'm, gr I'm grateful, for instance, for her alacrity in making an unbidden phone call that meant that when Barbara and I went to Gloucester, Massachusetts, Charles Olson's son and wife were prepared to meet us. As you'll see, her many efforts on behalf of her late husband have included 
not only the publication of an authoritative selected letters and our library's housing of his books, but the gift of conveying to all of us the character and experiences of one of the crucial American poets. Uh, after this session, please stick around for snacks around the corner in the classroom and the next session beginning <coughs> at 11.15. So, thank you, everybody, and Steve, thank you for that introduction. I can hardly take any credit for Robert's letters. That all belongs to Kaplan and Rod Smith. Can, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Good. It was always my job at Robert's readings to stand up the back and make sure that people could hear him <laughs> because he had a very quiet voice, and I was always waving my, no, no. <laughs> so, if you can't hear me, do the same. Laura Fudra, thank you very much for making all this happen with Steve. I know that you were crucial in the integration, and I know what a difficult job coordinating and integrating could, can be, so I very much appreciate it. Um, and Steve. And Steve. <laughs> it's great. So thank you also for listening to me. First of all, I want to make clear to you that I am not a scholar of Robert's work. That's other people's jobs. Thank you for doing it again. <laughs> but I, it's definitely not me. I um, lived with Robert for nearly 30 years. I'd be happy to still be living with him. Um, but such is life. You all probably know far more about his work than I do. I haven't read everything he's written. I've recently been reading his interviews and find them absolutely wonderful. I recommend them to you all <laughs> because it's like hearing him talk again. He was a wonderful, discursive talker. We were driving, for instance, we drove for miles. My first experience of America was driving from Buffalo, New York to New Mexico, and Robert would talk. And he would talk in circles. He would begin with a particular point. What do you think of? And then he would go all the way around and we could go between, say, Indiana and Kansas. <laughs> and we would just come back to the next where we began. It was a wonderful experience. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And I would sometimes have to say to him, louder, Robert, I can't hear you. What are you, what are you muttering about? Because he would get inside himself when he was talking. Somebody once asked me to please tell them what we talked about. I can't possibly do that. I couldn't do that now. I probably couldn't have done it then. But it was, it was often very funny. Kaplan pointed out to me, reading over Robert's letters, that he realized he was a very funny person. He was, uh, had a wonderful sense of humor. It was quick. His wit was so fast and it would be gone in a second. It was a sort of main sense of humor where somebody would um, you say something, but they wouldn't giggle themselves or, you know, to indicate that it was a joke. You had to get it or you didn't. I think that maybe it was something we shared. But I wouldn't like to credit myself with that. So I wrote a, a piece about how I met Robert, um, which I think is online. And I sort of thought that it may, probably you had read it and I wouldn't just do that again. So I'm going to tell you another little thing about Robert, which was his... Oh, I'm going to tell you another little thing about Robert, which was his relationship to libraries. And it, it's kind of discursive, and it sort of tells stories. So here we, here we go. Does anyone have any water? Okay. Well, never mind. Don't, don't worry about it. Robert told me that as a child, he read every book in the West Acton Library. That was his home just outside of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Then his mother would take him to Concord, the slightly larger town nearby, where she would go to pick up her pay. Robert's mother, Genevieve, worked as the town nurse. The Concord town hall was right next door to the library. When Mrs. Creeley would go to the town hall to pick up her salary, Robert and his sister, Helen, would go to the library. There's a photograph of Helen in the series of photographs that's up there. Um, she's the an older woman with gray hair in the photograph. She was four years older than Robert, and they were very close. 
So Robert worked his way through the Concord Library shelves too, eagerly reading stories. He told me that stories about animals were his favorite. One he always held very dear was Bob, son of battle, which I believe is a Scottish story about a border collie sheepdog. Years later, Robert was asked to contribute an anthology of to an anthology of authors writing about their favorite books. When that anthology finally arrived, he was thrilled to see that Bob, son of battle, was the favorite book of Norman Mailer as well. <laughs> who, who, who could ever have guessed that? <laughs> he, he was completely delighted by that. In the early days, through high school too, Robert had wanted to be a vet. He lived on a small farm in West Acton, Mass, which in those days was a very rural community. And he had a pony called Dapper Dan, a Great Dane called Lena, and he raised pigeons as a hobby. That was something that interested him all through his early life. And, and in, um, I don't know if you came across the book that he published <coughs> of, about pigeons. It's probably with you, because it's no longer with me somewhere. But anyway, I think it was published by Divers Press, which was his public. So anyway, there's that book. So Robert loved the Concord Library, but Concord, compared to West Acton, was the wealthy town and carried for Robert a sense of authority and propriety in a forbidding New England sort of a way. Somehow he felt those people were entitled and he was not. Still, the library was a crucial focal point for him and his sister Helen. It's, uh, Robert's father, well, I, maybe i come to that later. Robert took me to see where he had grown up in West Acton soon after I arrived in America. It was, late, it was 1976, in late July, very soon after the great bicentennial celebrations of the revolution, which had focused on Concord, where the revolution had begun, where the rude bridge arched the flood and all that. I confess I knew absolutely nothing about the American Revolution, or so little as to not matter at all. I knew nothing of American literature either, I'm ashamed to admit. I had heard of Emerson, and perhaps, to be generous to myself, I had read a couple of Hawthorne stories. But Walden Pond, right there by Concord, was just a small lake to me. I remember asking Robert who Walden was. I was, I was seriously that ignorant. <coughs> Henry David Thoreau, I probably thought, was a, a Frenchman. Excuse me. <laughs> it's embarrassing to say now, but it's true. Somehow, you know, growing up in New Zealand, everything was Anglo-centric. It wasn't at all American-centric. And um, my mother had spent, she actually went to Bryn Mawr for a little while. She was a Quaker, and associations between uh, England and uh, America were common for her. But later in life, because of the war, she became a little... Um, Americophobic. <laughs> what else can I say? Um, when I told her that I was thinking of coming to live in America, she said, do you have to? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this day in Concord was a great day. It was hot and hazy Massachusetts summer. We moseyed about Hawthorne's old manse and looked at his signature scratched in the mullion window in a tiny upstairs room. We saw how closely integrated these wondrous people had lived, and we imagined them in their lives there. Then we went to the newer part of town, sat outside the handsome brick library. Robert was feeling quite confident, pleased to be on home turf after a long time away, remembering so much pleasure in that library building as a child. I, I remind you again in this story that Robert was a very shy person, and he was a very unassuming person. He used to have what he, what he called his country cousin ways. He didn't feel himself to be at all sophisticated. And uh, apparently, he didn't speak really at all until he was about seven years old, which is a curious, remarkable thing for somebody who became such an eloquent speaker as he was. Um, when he lost his eye, 
he, it was, and then very soon after that, his father died. I think it was all quite shocking to him, and he sort of retreated inside himself. But books were, I think, very important to him from an early time because of that. But partly, too, his reserve was shyness. Um, so this story has a lot to do with that shyness. Anyway, so he was very pleased to be in Concord, and we were sitting outside the building. I, he must have, he was very hesitant about going inside. I must have persuaded him to go, though, because he, we went in very quietly and respectfully. It was cool and hushed in the high vaulted, impressive front lobby. I imagined Robert as a child coming there with his mum and sister, their eager whispers and the cloth bag of books. Robert, now maybe 40 years later, wondered if they might possibly have any of his own books in the library. That would have made a pleasant cycle for him, a sense of having made it in some way, <coughs> and for his mother too, who once said of Robert, I'm sure he could get a real job if he had to. <laughs> <coughs> Robert's father had been a prosperous and innovative doctor, but had died suddenly when Robert was four. His mother had struggled hard to continue to provide for her family all through the Great Depression. They were a close, loyal, witty, and very smart family. Besides Robert and Helen, Ira and Caroline Jules, Genevieve Creeley's parents, lived in their household. Caroline, Robert's mother, was able to recite vast amounts of poetry by heart. She used to like to have something in her head as she went about her day's work, she told her grandchildren. So she memorized long, long stretches of Longfellow, of Robert Greenleaf Whittier, and the great old New England poets. One of Robert's favorite of them was Whittier's Snowbound, very appropriate. <laughs> he would sometimes recite passages of, of it himself during a buffalo blizzard. So <laughs> was, we, we knew that one. So our visit to the library that day in 1976 was a very real occasion for him, and knowing Robert's shyness, I hoped for him very much that they would indeed have one of his books in the library. Most likely it would be for love, we thought. So we went to the desk to ask. We were sternly directed to look in the card catalogue. <laughs> of course. The catalogue was at the back of that vaulted, echoing, quiet, and impressively imposing hall. Robert was hesitant. He went tentatively towards the catalogue, housed then in pre-computer days in stacks of small wooden drawers. I was more confident than Robert was. I wasn't intimidated and less aware of the significance of New England's social hierarchies and the act and conquered class disparities. I wasn't haunted by a childhood of increasing poverty in a town where propriety was all. I was confident in Robert's ability and still largely unaware of the insignificance of poets and poetry in the hierarchies of authors. So I blithely found the C's in the wooden file drawer and beckoned Robert to come over to find his own name among the neat little white cards. I still remember him walking towards me with a little smile as he exaggeratedly tiptoed <laughs> his finger to his lips in a silent shh as humor returned and we got further away from the stern lady at the, ba at the desk. Creeley, hmm. CR was towards the back of the drawer. We had to pull the drawer out further to see the CRs. Then we had to pull it even further out, just a little bit further, and oh my God, <laughs> the drawer crashed to the oh. floor. Oh. You can imagine the sound. It was not a carpeted floor. It was the, the hardwood floor in the silent vaulted hall. The sound waves echoed from every beam and every plank, every polished table service, and every shocked, startled face, which suddenly turned our way in outrage. The little white cards splayed across the floor and skittered under chairs like fall leaves in a breeze. It was awful, and Robert was completely horrified. <laughs> it was just dreadful, and the stern library lady was suddenly upon us. <laughs> she was scolding and brusque and irritated and flustered by our incompetence and our disarray. She shooed us away and did not. She certainly did not want us to help her pick up the cards. 
we left. We didn't find out if the Concord Library had any of Robert's books. <laughs> it wasn't fun anymore at all, and it took us quite a while to be able to laugh about that small disaster. It seemed to confirm for Robert that he did not belong in a library. From being a kid who had delighted in all the joys of reading and books, he felt he had become an outcast. I asked him where the change had come from, because it was a sad change. It, um, we soon did laugh about that occasion, but it took a while. <laughs> if he said it wasn't from school, but from college. He had decided to go to Harvard when he was accepted there. In a foreword to Mary Novick's inventory of his work, he says, I had applied to Amherst and the University of Pennsylvania, as well as to Harvard. The first two offered excellent preparation for veterinary medicine, which I then hoped would be my profession, and both offered me substantial scholarships. Harvard's acceptance, however, despite a lack of any financial assistance, must have turned my head coming from a small New Massachusetts town as I did. Robert told me about the embarrassment he felt when he first went to Harvard in the obvious differences between himself as a person from a poor family and the wealthier, more entitled students. A tweed jacket, for instance, was de rigueur, even possibly required by university dress code. He and his mother had bought one they could afford, a seemingly adequate jacket with leather buttons. It looked like everybody else's jacket, but when it rained, the leather buttons dissolved. They were made of cardboard, not leather at all. And I, th I thought that just was a heartbreaking story. His shoes had holes in the soles as well very soon. He stuffed those with paper and went on. It must have been awfully cold in those Boston winters. And somehow, he missed going to the introductory tour of the libraries. It was a crucial omission. He didn't hear the then, in that all-important moment, how to use the Harvard system properly, and forever afterwards he was too shy to ask. So sadly, libraries became symbols of authority to him and represented not accessible knowledge, but a meeting out of proprietary information to the privileged and those deemed worthy of access by its guardians. So. Now why do I tell you such information as this mom at this moment, just when we are celebrating his books being made part of this library, an occasion I certainly celebrate enthusiastically and can say unhesitatingly that Robert would have celebrated too? Mostly, I tell you because I want to make clear to you how very particular Robert's books were to him. They were part of his life in a way that was almost organic. Mostly they didn't come from shops. They sprang from his life and accumulated almost like a symbiotic relationship such as one might find between soil biota and the plants they engender. Robert and his books were mutually interdependent. Reading his interviews and essays lately, I've been struck again by how regularly, how often and always he quotes and requotes phrases that were foundational to his thinking from his friends, his associates and colleagues, his elders, as he called them, and his beloved company. Once in Buffalo, there was a new graduate student, Robert, who heard Robert talking about the company. She thought he was referring to a business, some sort of commercial <laughs> undertaking. We, and luckily she, thought it was hilarious when we realized the misunderstanding. But these people and their work, their books, were so much part of Robert's life he would often say he couldn't remember if he read it or if he wrote it. Was it Duncan who said, dot, dot, dot? He would say, or was it Olson in Mayan letters who said something else? Or Williams was constantly quoted. You'll know this Kaplan from the letters. Olson, they were all utterly beloved to him, Zukovsky. They were part of his everyday conversation, part of his thinking. It was like brickwork in his mind. It was completely there. If Robert had been a gardener, his books would have been his plants, his gloriously nurtured trees, shrubs, and vegetables, his perennials, and his exciting annuals. The words would have been his soil, full of life and nourishment, both animal and mineral, full of texture, smell, and essential moisture. So these books are here now, 
are a gathering of the company. It's the Berkeley Conference still and the Vancouver Poetry Festival of the 60s. It's a lifetime of travel and readings, of talk around a table or in a car. It's thinking on your feet and dancing sitting down. It's walking and debating, thinking to the point, and thinking in discursive conversational circles. It's the life, it's manifested, and it's still here. And to finish the story of libraries, it has a happy ending. The Buffalo Public Library was a marvelous place for us. The main branch was and still is downtown, an anchor against the flight that's left the rest of the area abandoned and decaying. It's a diverse place to mingle quietly, where people come for a common purpose, a quite individual purpose as well, to read and to find books, but also a communal purpose, insofar as they rely on a common provision, a common place open to all and available. It's an inside-outside harmony. You'll, people who know Robert's work will know that inside-outside was very important to him. It was a constant dilemma how to get from his inside to outside and that's what poetry was for him. It was a way of thinking through and writing it down and then get it, getting it out, how to get said what must be said is the way he thought of it and I think that's a quote from Williams. Anyway, it says, because it was this inside-outside harmony, the Buffalo Library was a place where Robert was very much at home. He would go mosey in the record stacks, mostly. He'd come home with heavy piles of LPs to record for the kids. He would bring home classical music, too, and a lot of jazz. Later, he discovered the video cassettes and recorded a lot of those as well. Will and Hannah loved them. Mostly he didn't borrow books, but sometimes he did, especially when he would get on a tear of reading all the works of one author, all in a rush. Usually that would be a novelist's work, Someone like Patrick White, I remember particularly, he loved Patrick White for a little while, and Margaret Drabble was another favorite, usually aeroplane reading. Anyway, we had many happy expeditions down to the Buffalo Library, and the bugbear of the sense of privilege dispensed, diminished and faded into the past, even to the extent that Robert hoped once, when the house, our house where we were living was crowded with action, he hoped to get a carol down at the library to work in. He never did, but he was comfortable with the idea. It wasn't the idea of libraries that he was guarded about. He loved the idea, and as a child, loved the fact of them. He loved the common, the daily, the domestic, and the particularity of libraries. Not the possession of knowledge, but the living of it, in the sharing of it, and the passing of it on. So now, I'm deeply grateful that you've all made that, part, that living fact, the acquisition and the passing on, the commonality of it, all possible again. Thank you. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Um, and also, if you like, I'm happy to answer questions that you might have about Robert and his um, associations with artists and so on, if I can. I will. Shall we do that now? Or? You were going to talk a little bit about Alex Katzen. The, uh, oh, yes. So on, in the, that, this is some of the work with Jim Dyan that I just heard that maybe you don't have here. This is... A sort of curious sense of things, and this was uh, a collaboration with Jim. I'm not really sure how they go together, um, the images and the poem, but the poem is one that Robert wrote later in his life. And I can't remember the name of it, but it's a wonderful poem that's at the end of the collected poems. It's the one that says, I will sit here. Uh, it's, it's terrific. Anyway, the images are a little curious combined with the poem, I, I don't think they quite go together, but it's, uh, they're wonderful images and it's a fabulous poem. <laughs> so, um, Alex Katz and Robert collaborated on a book called Edges, and uh, some of these images, of, of this is for instance Maine, 
and the edges of the field that Robert <coughs> talks about. This is um, Mount Auburn Cemetery where Robert's buried, but there are a lot of images of Maine in there. And the edges are the ones that Robert talks about, the hazy summer field. Alex and Robert worked uh, very easily together because we would spend both spend summers quite close together and they would come over for dinner or we would go over there for lunch and we would ha they would hang out and talk. It was, I was telling Simone as we drove down yesterday that Alex loved Theodore Dreiser, for instance. He thought that uh, he was very much uh, one of the great unread American authors. And Robert would always tell me about Theodore Dreiser when we would be driving from Buffalo to New Mexico as we came through Indiana. He would tell me that this was the place of Theodore Dreiser and I should read Sister Carrie and you know, he would introduce me to places through the literature of the area. So, so Alex uh, and Robert did this beautiful book together called Edges. They had also collaborated earlier on a, um, an, an opera, Lysistrata, and the idea had been Lygia, Lygia thank yeah. you and thank you <laughs> and they um, they had imagined a production of it and Alex was going to do the stage set which uh, he did a little sketch for and it was going to be the most minimal stage set you could imagine <laughs> but I think it would have been fun it never came to be but it did turn into a book right Steve it did you published it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had something to do with it. <laughs> See, I told you I'm bad. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was that was that was a beautiful collaboration. The music never never got together. There was a, the musicians were the um, the link that didn't work. So it never happened. But uh, Alex painted a portrait of Robert. I was telling Steve about it that. Uh, when we first saw it, it he, did, he did it in a couple of sittings over the summer. Robert would go over there, Alex painted the portrait, and it was fun. It was exciting, and you know, it was interesting to see the to see the portrait evolve. And then we finally saw it in his in Alex's place in New York, and we couldn't quite figure out what was wrong with the with the portrait. It was uh, looking at it very curiously, and. Uh, we suddenly realized that Alex had actually painted Robert with two eyes. <laughs> Robert only had, had one. He had lost one in a car accident when he was a child. So, so that was <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it didn't matter, really. <laughs> and the portrait is now in the Farnsworth Museum near us in Maine, so it keeps the cycle together. And there's also a portrait there of Robert that Francesco Clemente did which is an interesting one as well. It's very um, moody, powerful portrait where Robert is all head and his legs are little things going out <laughs> sideways, which um, in some ways seems appropriate. Got a head above him. Oh, and this is Kitai. Yes, this very strange disembodied head. <laughs> it's almost like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, somewhere I saw a, another portrait of Robert, which was the poster for the show, uh, the collaborations in New York, um, and that's hanging out there. And that was this, that too was by R.B. Kitai, Ron Kitai, who came from Cleveland originally. I love that that uh, Kitai came from Cleveland because to me he was always the ultimate urban Londoner. He was <laughs> very, very, um, very much the city gentleman. When I knew him, thanks to Kitai, we got to stay in Spain. When when Robert and I were first together, we went for um, four months to stay in Kitai's house in the on San Feliu de Guichot, which is north of Barcelona. We stayed there. It was unbelievably cold. It was four months uh, of Spanish winter, which doesn't sound as though it should be cold, but it was very damp. And Kitai was a real book collector. He loved books. He would go around all those little romantic booths on the Seine in Paris, for instance, and he knew all the book collectors of Europe. He would go and really pore over them and find first editions and wonderful things in proper book person fashion. And he had them all stored in this house in Saint-Felieu, which was fantastic, but terrifying because the 
walls were literally crumbling with the damp. They would come, when we would wake up in the morning, there would be a, a mist of dew, a little dabbling of dew all over the blankets. It was so wet. So I hope those books are all right. So they probably are. <laughs> anyway, he, he was also a very good friend. We're in, uh, I think Robert went to London in the 70s before I met him. He wrote a long poem called In London. And uh, there he really hung out with Kitai and Jim Dine and Robert. I think they did a lot of things together and I think it must have been a great deal of fun. I never saw all three of them in the same room at the same time. I saw the picture of uh, the little portrait that Allen Ginsberg took of Robert um, that was taken out of Neville Purple. Could you tell a little bit about the relationship between Allen and Robert and then how that went? I, can, I can't tell you about the early days because I wasn't there. Robert had just turned 50 when I met him. And I know that he spent... I don't know where he met Alan. I'm pretty sure that Alan was in San Francisco in the 50s, uh, late 50s, when Robert left Black Mountain. He went to Albuquerque for a little while because his friend Buddy Berlin from Harvard was living there. And Buddy had a lot of associations with jazz. Buddy was a trumpet player himself. Buddy was the husband of Lucia Berlin, whose um, books, a fantastic short story writer, Lucia's books, book is soon going to be in a collected stories of Lucia Berlin, which is going to be coming out fairly soon, I recently heard, so that'll be wonderful. So Lucia and Buddy lived in Albuquerque, and a lot of um, jazz players, musicians, would come through Albuquerque, and they would stop off at Buddy's. So I think it was just a fantastic place to be, and uh, that, that's where um, Robert met Sonny Rollins, which I think must have been huh. really great. Yeah. So then from San Fran from Albuquerque, he went on to San Francisco, because Alan was there, and Joanne Kiger and um, Gary Snyder were back from Japan, and um, Kerouac was there, and a lot of other people. And um, they must have been wild, wild times. <laughs> that was where, um, when, that's where that phrase dancing, sitting down comes from, because Jack and Robert were both really shy. And uh, they would sit in the bar, and they would clap, and they would drum on the table. <laughs> and generally, it would be quite exciting, I think. Um, but they called it dancing sitting down <laughs> because they were too shy to get up and down. Um, and Alan must have been part of that, that action. In fact, I'm sure he was because there are stories about Alan um, introducing him to Jack. They, there's a story that uh, they said, Jack, I think Alan said, meet us at such and such a bar, Jack will be there. And Robert got there a bit earlier, and then Alan came in and said, um, have you seen Jack? And Robert hadn't spotted him, although he had spotted the sort of energetic, in, intense-seeming person sitting in the back. And Alan said, that's him over there. And uh, so they, I think they had a, a pretty good friendship. Um, and they stayed together in Mill Valley for a while. And then later, when I arrived, uh, we went to stay in Alan's place in New York. It was in the one on, what is it, Avenue C? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was small, but um, it was, they were so wonderfully kind to me. They were so friendly and hospitable and welcoming. Uh, it was very heartwarming, and they were very domestic. They cooked dinner. They cooked something nice for dinner. Everybody came and came up from downstairs, and we, we spent time there. Later on, 
I managed to lose my wallet in a New York taxi, and it was in. The t it also somehow had our plane tickets in it, mm. which was dreadful because you know we didn't have much money, and we had come from New Mexico. It was a real terrific treat for us to be in New York. I lost my. I lost the tickets getting out of a cab, on uh, on the Bowery. And we were going to visit Ted Berrigan. We had been to see Burroughs, <laughs> and. Uh, Alan had had to throw pebbles up at the window of Burroughs apartment because they, it was all um, closed up but with plywood. He had sort of sealed himself in. The Bowery was more like Bombay in those days. So it was a very, I was telling Simone last night as we were coming down that it was, you know, it was very densely populated, hot summer and a lot of people sleeping on the streets. It wasn't a, wasn't the sort of upscale place it is now. So, um, yeah, that was certainly a very interesting visit, and um, then we went to see Ted Berrigan, and that was when I realized I had lost my wallet. And um, after panicking and trying to make f calls with quarters from uh, low phone booth and all, it was just fantastic to see Ted Berrigan had got up off his bed, and he had come down and he was coming along the street towards me like a wonderful bear <laughs> to save me. It was just fantastic. I'm forever grateful for, to Ted for doing that. And then later on you asked me about Alan's. <laughs> Robert and I went back to Alan's and we had the most furious row and the only place we could have a row was in the little tiny bathroom in the little lavatory. <laughs> 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 passionately angry with each other. <laughs> anyway, somehow people were incredibly generous and they lent us money and we got back to New Mexico. But. So what else about Alan? He would come around when, when Robert's, hell, Robert's sister's uh, daughter was killed in a car accident in Maine and uh, Helen wanted to raise money for um, Sarah's memorial fund so Robert thought well, they were, everybody was going up to a conference in Orono and Alan said he would come down to Walderborough and read in the little Walderborough library. So he, he did. It was, it was just a wonderful occasion. The, like, nobody could believe that Alan Ginsberg was going to come to Walderborough. And um, he, di he did come and he read uh, some of his more explicit poems. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was sitting next, upstairs in the balcony, I was sitting next to the, uh, her, uh, a friend who's an architect, and he was so shuddering with outrage. Mm. Uh, he's still a very good friend, and they're very, they're great people, but if I mention it now, he still can, <laughs> can hardly bear it, and it's, what, 30 years later? <laughs> so, so I always was so impressed by Alan's courage. I think he was one of the bravest, warmest, most immediate, and friendly people I've ever met. His, his love for his friends was extraordinary. I was thinking of Amiri Baraka, for, who was also a fantastic person. And talk about friendship. Baraka would go where he came up to Buffalo a couple of times uh, after Robert had died, too. And he would, be, he would just be there. He said he would be there. Sometimes it was really difficult for him to be there, but he would show up in that sense of, Integrity, really. It was a sense of integrity that you stood up for people who you cared about. And uh, Baraka did that so well. You know, there was a sense that um, he did separate from his white friends for a while because he needed to. He needed to make that radical statement. Um, but he, w he didn't disappear by any means. He always would, would come out and be there when they asked. 
which is very important to remember. He, he would show up. Um, I'm, I'm very sad that he died recently. I was very moved by his son Ras's oration at his funeral, his eulogy. Did anybody else get to hear that? It was online. I, could, I saw it while I was in New Zealand. I could, you could see it. Um, Tom Rayworth, I think, has a link to it on his blog. Um, so why was I talking about Baraka? Alan and Baraka were, were very good friends. Oh, I remember why. When Alan was dying, he um, was calling his friends to say he was dying. And the, the story that I remember from that is that he called Baraka and said, and asked Baraka if he and Amina needed anything. And uh, Baraka said, I don't know. Just a moment, let me ask. And he called upstairs, hey, Amina, Alan's on the phone. Do we need anything? <laughs> and she said, no, we're fine. <laughs> Give him my love. <laughs> and that was it. And I, th I think Alan actually died very soon after that. It was, uh, anyway, I mean, that, that sort of thing, to me, makes these people worth the world. To me, those, those stories are so dear. They're so, they, Yeah. Did he ever uh, talk to you about William Bronk? Because I know yes. he admired Bronk. He did admire Bronk. Um, Bronk was a violinist, right? No, Bronk was a poet. I know who he and, is. And, I know and, who he is. But for some reason, I associate him with a violin. Did he play? No. <laughs> did, did you know him well? Very well. Why do I associate him with a violin? <laughs> but but, um, but Robert no, actually, I know that. Um, when I, I edited uh, with somebody else uh, an issue of the journal Zagatry, yeah. devoted to, uh, to Bronx, right? And Robert contributed a, um, I think it was a, it was a poem um, for Bronx, and he also wrote a letter about about Bronx. I know he admired his poetry very much. So I was just wondering if. He did talk to me about him. I know that he admired him. He, he was, he thought Bronck was a very fine poet, a fine craftsperson. Um, I'm trying to figure now why I associ associated that. Did, did Bronck write a poem about a violin? Not, not that I know. Okay. But Br Bronck was involved, Olsen admired Bronck. Yes. And Bronk was involved with Sid Corman. Right. Right. Well, I'm sorry I can't tell you any okay. more than that. I, I never met William Bronk, but I do know that Robert admired him very much as, as a poet, and I know that he was very pleased to make that contribution. And I think they had some little correspondence back and forth around that between the two of them. I'm sorry I can't remember any more than that. Anyone else? Speak much of Olsen. Oh, yes, <laughs> always. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, how to say it. He, he said. <laughs> <laughs> he said that Olsen was just what you, a giant of, of, in every respect. They, you know, all that, a lot of that correspondence, that huge volumes and volumes of correspondence was written before they ever met. And um, Robert, when they did meet, it was at Black Mountain, and Olsen had no idea <coughs> that Robert was so young. They, he was apparently just flabbergasted to find that he'd been writing to a kid. <laughs> so I, th I think maybe Robert was 26 or 27 when he got to Black Mountain, but he s must have seemed older in his letters. And then, you know, when, by the time I showed up, uh, Olsen had died a couple of, well, he, I think he died in 72, was it 77? 70? 
70, okay. So Robert was just still so shaken by Olsen's death at that stage. Um, really, really sad. And he would read me. It was one of the ways that he got me to know America was to read to me. And he would read me Olsen's poems and he would just have tears streaming down his face. He, was, he could never read Olsen really without be feeling so moved. Um, yeah, I mean, R Robert's life, with they were so intertwined, their thinking and their growing up was so intertwined that it's impossible to think of them separately. I mean, not really, n n because they became very different. And I think towards the end, um, the one that their friendship changed in the nature in the way that friendships will it changed um and they went their different ways um, I, I, it was a very deeply rooted friendship i don't think it went away in any way other than to change but it did it did change and uh, so robert was left with some confusion around that. Um, but, yeah, he, uh, I don't know what to say to you that he said specifically because you can't, I, I can't, you know, I can't remember some encapsulating story or phrase. It was just, Olsen was part of his life. Um, always, always there, always there. Charles Peter came to Buffalo um, to get to, to have a sense of um, his father's family when he was a he he came to Buffalo to be an undergraduate. He was probably in his early twenties, I suppose. And uh, yeah, I, he came to us to stay to stay in Buffalo and to have a sense of that world that his father had lived in and Charles Peter's mother was killed near Buffalo so I think it was a sense of coming home it was a, it was very good to have his company there for a good long time and he's still a, a very good friend that's it thanks Penelope. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.